Hello and welcome to Self-Sufficient Conversations. I'm your host, Natalie, and we will be talking with Jane from Earth Soul Garden in this week's episode in our podcast series, where we explore what self-sufficiency means to others. I met Jane earlier last year when we started our professional permaculture journey together by completing our PDC. Jane is currently in a rental and has a wonderful and productive potted edible garden that I would love to dive deeper into because I think it could encourage a lot of people who feel like growing veg is unattainable for them due to their living situation. But first, can you tell us how you started growing food? Um, well, basically, um, I was fed up with buying um, supermarket food that would go off within just a couple of days. And um, I also watched a couple of documentaries, you know, same as a lot of people out there and realizing what gets sprayed all over our food as well. Um, and I just thought um, I need to, um, you know, make some more healthy choices. So I thought I'm going to try grow my own food. And that's exactly what I did. I wasn't exactly a gardener back then. And we're talking about five, six years ago. Um, but I, same as a lot of gardeners out there, I just learnt by doing, um, and I made quite a lot of mistakes. Um, but when you get, when you uh, see your very first tomato ripen, that was it for me. I thought that was it. And now I started planting as much fruit as I possibly could. So then it went from, you know, tomatoes to zucchinis and pumpkins, just whatever I could fit in. Cause I, I all, I've always rented. I, I've never owned my own home. So um, I just realized that I was whinging and complaining about being a renter and not being able to do what I wanted in the garden rather than making, you know, use of the space that we did have and that we could grow in. Mm. So I thought, um, think outside the box. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, I've been growing food for a few years now. And um, to be honest, it's a normality now. It's just normal to go out and pick food and eat it rather than go to the supermarket. I'm not saying I'm completely not reliant on supermarkets, but I wish I could be one day because I really would like that very much. Um, nice. yeah. And I'm working on it. It's a work in progress. <laughs> That's awesome. And you grow everything in pots or majority in pots? At this year, I'm growing everything in pots because I did actually build two no-dig beds last year, um, which went really, really well, um, except um, in summer, and that it was only like one tiny little patch in the backyard, which I was allowed to build beds on top of. Um, but unfortunately, it's underneath the chestnut tree, um, and the boughs are really low, and so I can't, I'm not actually growing anything in it at the moment, because it gets no sun at all. Mm. Um, so yes, everything's in pots. I've got runner beans, cucumbers, chilies, capsicums, zucchinis, um, and lots of eggplant as well, um, plus all my pollinating plants as well. So yeah, it's, it's, I think I've pretty much proved to myself that you could grow anything in a pot. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing you seeing your garden. Um, it's it's yeah, huge well, and, and abundant and in pots, which is yeah. not something I'd usually associate with that. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, someone had suggested to me growing in pots before and I just thought, how can I get enough nutrition for a plant in one pot, you know? And it's just all about knowing about soil and compost mm. and what a plant needs to actually grow, you know. So whether that be, you know, some really good potting mix and then you add in, you know, blunt bone or, you know, your own compost or stuff like that. And then, you know, um, then I've realised that you need to sort of back off on the nitrogen mm. once they start producing the buds for flowers. So then I actually chuck in banana, stick, banana peels. Okay. in the pot and yeah so for pot potassium um to help encourage flowering and stuff like that but yeah i haven't had any issues with that you know so if you plan it well and you know give it give your um, mix a really good start it should see your um, plant through the whole season and um i seem to have got it right fingers crossed i hope i don't go out there tomorrow <laughs> and it's all like you know <laughs> dead <laughs> I'm sure it won't terrible. be <laughs> so did you not. make your own compost to make your potting mix 
Well, it's half and half um, because I started making, um, I actually stole some of the um, mix from my no dig beds because obviously I wasn't using it. And that was really mainly just straw and manure, uh, <laughs> poo, I think it was poo. Um, and also some um, potting mix just locally made up in Sylvan here um, and then I just mixed it all together with a little bit of blood and bone okay. um, and that was pretty much it and then I just mulched it with local straw as well okay, and nice. um, yeah yeah so I it was it was really an experiment because I've never actually grown food in pots before mm. and I wasn't really sure you know the nutrition levels and all that sort of stuff so seems to be going fine at the moment I just keep up with the watering and yeah, yeah it's fine yeah, they're so. undercover in your gazebo area or are they out do they do you move some of them out to the full sun or rain well, <laughs> that we're getting found, yeah well uh, la nina is actually really great for a lot of plants um and but my tomatoes were starting to suffer a little bit so i've actually pruned off a lot of the leaves just to create more airflow yeah um but it was getting too hot for the tomatoes um underneath the laser light there yeah. Um, so all my tomatoes are outside in pots, okay. um, just in various spots around the garden. Nice. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And but underneath the uh, laser light there, I've got runner beans. So I've actually set up a trellis um, across three pots, and I've wedged it in with rocks. Um, and then I've got beans, just like probably about eight feet high, runner beans. Yeah. And same with the cucumbers and all that. They're all fine underneath there because they don't mind the heat. Um, and the chilies and eggplants and zucchinis are fine under there as well. It was really just those wimpy tomatoes that I had to move. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and because I wasn't allowed to dig up the lawn, the plumber came by to put in a new pipe mm -hmm. and he dug up the lawn. And I said, <laughs> how deep is that pipe? <laughs> and he said, oh, about 50, 60 meals. I said, great, because you've dug up the lawn. I'm going to put pumpkins in there. So I've got a <laughs> row of pumpkins. As well. And I, I can't, they can't tell me I've dig up the lawn because I didn't do it. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to make use of that space, you know. I'm not, I'm just, I'm, sti I'm still playing by the rules, but, you know, <laughs> just bend them just a little bit, you know. And my... My pollinator um, plant bed extends by a few mils each year. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. you know, one day if I keep at it, it might take over the whole garden. <laughs> totally should. I don't know why they don't want you to um, create a beautiful, uh, not just edible, but everything that you do, pollinators and biodiversity that you've got there. Yeah. Who would well, want that? Well, yeah, I've... I would want that and I think because I don't think that they know really about it too much. I think if I had time to sort of convince them by showing them things and doing a plan and stuff like that, but I get the feeling that they're not really interested at all. This was their parents' house and okay. they grew the garden from scratch. So I, just, mm -hmm. I think they envision me ripping things out and stuff like that rather okay. than what I would actually do by compliment it and mm -hmm. you know respect what they already have here but yeah it's just a it's an education thing I think yeah definitely. so yeah I don't think I'll ever get away with a beehive though <laughs> you could have a bee hotel for um native okay, bees well yes yeah, well, I've actually planted a few things specifically for blue banded bees because I love those buzzy little dudes. So do I. <laughs> um, yeah, they're so great. Um, but yeah, so, well, you know, baby steps, baby <laughs> steps. I already, I'm growing such an abundance. I'm actually going to be giving away food soon, like with That's the amazing. zucchinis and things. Yeah, I've, I've, I've amazed, amazed myself. So <laughs> you could yeah. try. We were talking. Anyone out there? <laughs> We were talking before we went on, on air, we were talking about um, Jane's goals for this year and that's to start preserving her own food and she's going to start by preserving tomatoes. But um, there's a really awesome um, piccalilli recipe from Pip Magazine and it's super, super easy. And you don't even have to, um, I mean, you can water bath it to store it for long term, but if you're only going to keep it for six months, you don't even have to water bath it and it's 
it's incredibly easy. I can send you the recipe. I can post the recipe down below if anyone else wants it um, because it's a real good one, a real easy one. I would love that. Anything that I can, I'm a sponge when it comes to new things like food preservation. Although, I mean, technically being a permi, I should know all about it. Well, I'm still learning. Like, yeah. You know, there's a Are lot of people out there that, yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> I'm probably still going to kill something this year as well. You know, that's just how it goes. But when it's food preservation, I'm still learning and I, yeah. anything that, you know, I love watching your videos as well. Like, you know, when you post video of uh, your <laughs> recipes for things, like I think you're doing soap or, <laughs> I don't know, candles or something at the moment. You're doing some, so many things with this one mixture and that just amazes me. Like, I, honestly, yeah. I can't believe it. So, yeah. And that, uh, yeah. the, the hand cream that you sent me, the comfrey and um, calendula hand cream, yeah. fantastic stuff. <laughs> I'm glad you If I can to learn all of that one day, I'll be really happy. Yeah. So yeah, it's I'm a open journey. to recipes. It's yeah, certainly absolutely. a journey. Yeah. This yeah. didn't just happen overnight. Like this has been ten plus years in the making. I've been making skincare since I was a teenager, just for fun, and then I developed it more into a business. Um, and then preserving food. It's it's hit and miss, but it's also like my journey in the kitchen. I've been in in the kitchen cooking since I was thirteen. Um, yeah. And so I've got you know that's twenty years. <laughs> Um, of cooking experience yeah, well, I mean you've, you've developed a lot of skills in that time as well and I think the ultimate goal for me is be self-sufficient in at least um, vegetables yeah. and bread nice um, and you know and if I can preserve as much food as possible you know like with pasta sauces you know passata mm. like you know like what pantry doesn't have passata so yeah. you know if you know and then who, who knows, but if I could be, I just want to become self-sufficient with food, you know, like I'm a vegetarian, my husband isn't, but I'm a vegetarian. So mm. really I could become self-sufficient with food one day. Um, yeah. You know, like if I don't want, you know, oats or <laughs> anything like that, you know, like, cause I'm still buying oats and rice yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But I don't, yeah. you know, um, apart from <clears throat> those few staples, it'd be really nice just to not have to go to the supermarket that's right for anything like that yeah yeah so that, and we're the same we still buy pantry staples i mean we've still got rice and oats and flour in the pantry um but the way that i call myself fully self-sufficient is that i'll sell my excess um because yeah. we do have the space and ability to do that and so then that can go on and purchase the things that i can't grow um preferably um sustainable if i can but if not then i just have to yeah. go convention conventional because yeah sometimes hard um either on budget or just you can't find it yeah i think well that's it and i also think that when people say self-sufficient um people want to be self-sufficient i think that can be different for everybody for sure like in different ways you know um and i think you know uh, self-sufficiency on any level with even just vegetables is something really awesome like yeah. imagine if you never had to go to the supermarket ever again yeah you know that would be um, pretty cool <laughs> yeah so I, you know i, I, did, I sort of I, it would it'd be amazing to me you know I, I would love that not to have to go at all you know but yeah. you know i just think there's um a lot of people when you say self-sufficient they um might think that you, it's it's your entire lifestyle you know everything right. yeah and that, I think you said nap. Sorry, you go. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, I think you actually said um, that, you know, you need community yep. um, to be self-sufficient, you know, um, and I think that's a big part of it, I think, mm. you know, because, you know, you're giving me recipes. I'm not going to, you know, I'll be either Googling it. I'd rather learn from someone local or someone that I know, you know, um, you know, to sort of, keep that community spirit you know face-to-face yeah. -face contact and you know being with people and learning together sort of thing you know when we did our pdc together it's mm. that community spirit has just stayed with me yeah you know um and we we can all expand that. we try to be self-sufficient um when we first moved here and the goal was that we'll just do everything ourselves and so that lasted like a few hours <laughs> it was supposed to be a 250 day challenge yeah. and it lasted a few hours because yeah. You just can't. 
do everything yourself. And so we can do most things. We can do all our own veggies. We can do all our own meat and our eggs. But everything else has to come from somewhere else. And whether that's neighbours or friends um, or, you know, clients that I can sell my access to to then fill in the gaps that we either need or want. I mean, some things we don't need. Like I don't need chocolate, but I want it and I buy it because life's boring without yeah. chocolate. Um, and uh, I can't grow my own cacao as much as I'd like to. <laughs> um, it's just not the right climate um, as with most other things that I use, like my spices and coconut products. Um, so for me um, and for many people, like you can totally be self-sufficient. You just need to get your little circle um, to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I yeah, I wholly concur. And that's you're a lot more further along than I am with this journey. And I, I can't you know, one day I hope to be, you know, in in more like in your position, you know, with my own property with more space. Yeah. Um, you know, so I can grow more food and um I'll have something to sort of swap with yeah. you know and sell and that sort of thing although with the amount of zucchinis i'm picking at the moment <laughs> just out of those pots um i'm ready in the right direction you know i've already given some away so nice. it's yeah that's awesome. amazing like what you can grow just with a little bit of like yeah i'm not gonna i'm, I'm just gonna grow <laughs> stuff in pots you know and <laughs> but your amazing. plants are so Watching big and healthy it. i i haven't they're, seen so, they're anyone like tomatoes and monsters. Like I haven't seen anyone else's no, well, potted garden look like yours. <clears throat> but it gives so much hope. Really? Yeah, it gives so much hope because um, when people use the excuse of, and I, I've used this excuse before as well, even though we owned our own home, I was always like, but we want a farm, so I'm just going to do, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. To Put things off and keep waiting for that yeah. perfect property to yeah. do all these things. Yeah. But the thing is, mm. it's never going to be perfect. Like we moved here and the soil's crap. And so, yeah. um, you know, it's harder to grow here than it was in suburbia. So even though you're waiting for that, that's something, um, just embrace what you have now because you don't know what the future is going to bring. Just like we saw at the beginning of 2020 um, where people freaked out yeah. and they realised that they needed to start growing food. Um, and there were no seeds left. And toilet else. paper. <laughs> toilet paper. And any uh, if canned you could grown toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else that ran off the shelves, and even um, local to our where we were doing our PDC, there's a place that I go to get my greenhouse um, stuff and my market garden stuff. So I get my coconut coir and my perlite um, and anything else that I need. And I popped in there because um, I wasn't sure if I was able to leave my rural area to go urban anymore. Uh, I popped in and to grab my stuff with putting mix and they're like, the phone hasn't stopped with people wanting to buy hot houses. Like just we've sold out. We can't, we don't have any more hot houses to sell, which is just insane. Um, that, it is a, that is insane, isn't it? Yeah. all of it, And these are not little hot houses that are like, you know, a meter by a meter. These are commercial sized hot houses that people are like, oh, I need Amazing. to start thinking about Amazing. food um, security. So it blew my mind. I think that's a massive, that, I think a massive shift has happened over this last year, whether, you know, you can actually physically see it or not, but mm. going by how much people are actually buying, yeah. there's a lot of food being grown out there now in back gardens and front gardens, you know, wherever they can, Yeah. you know, um, and I just, I, I think that gives me hope also, um, mm you know, that there has been a shift. People are thinking about where their food comes from, you know, yeah. don't rely on the supermarket. Yeah. You know, you can grow your own food, even if you live in a, an apartment. That's right. You know, with a box, you know, you can grow herbs there. That's and, right. you know. Lettuce. Yeah. And you can overwinter chilli um, or capsicum inside in a sunny window. I did that. Yeah. I actually had a perennial capsicum and it lasted for three years and I'm in Mumble. Yeah. Yeah, I had um, you know, I had a row of chilies. We used to live in Furniture Gully, which is um, eastern Melbourne, and um, it's fairly cool. Not as cold as I am now, but fairly cool. Um, and we did get frost there, especially in the veggie patch. But I had fluked it at the time. It was like there was no design. It was just planted where I could 
but I had, um, had these triangle beds and these diamond beds and they all kind of interlinked um, with a pathway between them and against our um, landing, I guess you'd call it, the entrance to the house it was like this big concrete and brick thing and um, the garden bed dropped down a little bit from that. And so there was like 20 centimetres of concrete um, against the chilies. And I didn't realise at the time, but I had these chilies and they weren't perennial ones. They were just regular chilies because all chilies are perennial. Mm -hmm. um, and they were there for five years before I chopped them out because they didn't get affected by frost because of where I planted them against this thermal mass. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, I can't do that here because I'm much colder. <laughs> um, but I have dug out even eggplants and put them in my hothouse over winter. And yeah. I planted them yeah. back in my garden this year. So, um, yeah, totally well, adorable. I'm thinking that I might be, I might, like, I want to try doing the similar, you know, because I should actually mention that um, even though my patio garden is under laser light, so it gets quite warm in there and the sides are open, but out in my, what I call my driveway garden, um, it's got a, um, is it, uh, do you call it tarmac, the driveway, yeah. is it tarmac? Or, yeah, um, or concrete you know, or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, and so it retains a lot of heat. Like some mm. days I can't even walk on it when the sun's been on it. Um, and then I've got the brick wall to the other side behind it. So there's a lot of thermal heat, you know, radiant heat coming from that. And I think that's yeah. probably why also why things do quite well there, like right into winter. Okay. You nice. know, so... Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's important to think about those things, about where you plant things and, yeah. you know, use what you've got. So, That's right, yeah. You know, microclimates. Yes. They something are your that friend. I've been, <laughs> something that I've only started paying attention to since we moved here. Um, back in suburbia, while we did get frost, it wasn't anything that I worried about. Um, but here I really need to be mindful because we are, um, the house is actually 350 metres above sea level but we go all the way to 400 and all the way down to 300. Um, and we are in an Alpine area. So we are 60 kilometers away yeah. from Mount Borbo and we snowed here twice last year, which is very novel for um, Australia. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so we want, we've got bananas. We've got three banana plants. We've got um, two tamarillos, a babaco, um, a few tropically guavas. They're not the, the tropical guava. They're um, related to the pineapple guava or the fijoa but these ones don't like frost. So they're all planted around our water tank um, because A, it's sheltered from the westerly winds that we get here, but it's also got yeah. the thermal mass from the water and the concrete um, to help um, fight away the frosts. <laughs> That's amazing. I've seen that garden. It's incredible. <laughs> I can't believe what you're growing there. But, you know, and this is the thing, like people, um, you know, who, wherever you live, if you rent or own a property, um, doesn't matter how big or small it is, guaranteed you'll have some little pocket of microclimate there where yeah. you might even be able to grow just one tomato plant yeah. in just this one little space. Um, yeah. But there'll be enough heat there and, um, and sunlight just to, you know, grow a tomato plant. And there's nothing... Yeah. You know, there's nothing better than growing your own tomatoes. But totally. I just, I've, I've proved myself that you can grow anything if you just plant it. Look at where you, where you can plant it. Mm. And um, yeah, I just, I just really hope that people um, watching or listening to this, or um, you know, just who are renting and don't have a lot of space, or they're not allowed to do certain things, um, just have a look at where the, what the sun's doing on your mm. property yep um you know you'll find warm little pockets um all over the place doesn't matter where you are like you know where you your water tank nap you know mm. i mean you know it's just yeah i just I've, i just think you can grow anything yeah even just small amounts just try just yeah, even right. herbs or a tomato plant yeah just try <laughs> yeah, you, you know everyone fails um, with gardening at some point but if you don't try you're never going to know how marvelous a gardener you're going to be you know that's right <laughs> I am um, it's taken me three years but I finally um, got my first flowers on a rosella plant which um, wow. yeah shouldn't really be grown down here like you can but you can't <laughs> um, 
It's amazing. And I failed, like I said, I failed for three years. And this is the last year that I gave myself to do it because we use a lot of hibiscus, rosella hibiscus, um, in teas and kombucha. And um, I wanted to actually just try it fresh off the plant because you can just eat them, yeah, as a sour, sweetie yeah. kind of thing. Um, so I'm really excited for that. And it I think that's amazing. Years. That's an achievement. <laughs> I'm yeah. oh, Only one plant, When though. I saw you, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, you're probably the only person in Victoria that is growing <laughs> a rosella on, on top of a hill in Gippsland, you know, like, just, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty um, impressed by that, actually, Nat. <laughs> yeah, I was very, very happy. So Rosella has a new spot in my garden. Maybe I'll try it in my little microclimate next year instead of down open in my veggie patch. Why not? You, I mean, <laughs> look at what you're growing already. I, I don't think there's anything you can't grow, apart from chocolate, you know, cacao. <laughs> or coconuts. <laughs> or coconuts. <laughs> Oh there, my goodness. There is someone not far from me. He's um, in Warrigal and his property is the most amazing place. It's called the Botanic Ark and he's a botanist and he has, oh, it's five acres. It was blank and it's just now full of trees and it's, you walk through it and you can feel the ground is like a sponge because of all the organic matter. Um, but he has oh, wow. women there, which shouldn't be grown in Australia basically at all unless you're really, really? Far north yeah um cinnamon so in Morrigal, which is cold <laughs> that's that's absolutely amazed me but it just goes to show if you if you you know there's probably just a little pocket right there yeah and all the so tree cover that he's got perfect conditions mm, so the frost mm, is almost probably I was going to say, it's probably created it's almost like a jungle type atmosphere yeah. in there, yeah. you know, just a climate sort of thing in there. That's yeah. rainforest is probably more like it. <laughs> yeah. We spent, we That's went amazing. there quickly to pick up something because um, he sells plants at markets and then you can pop in there on Sundays. And so we wanted to buy something and we spent five hours with him walking through his gardens and he was just explaining, he's so wow. passionate, but he was just explaining everything to us. Um, giving us seeds and advice and random edibles, rare edibles. Um, and it was just mind blowing, very inspiring. That is incredible. Incredible. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Well, I've actually decided to, um, I, with my business, I actually um, encourage people to actually plant native food gardens as well mm. as, you know, your regular tomatoes or whatever else you want to grow yeah because um i think that sometimes it's easy to forget that we've got a lot of native food plants which that's you right. know are amazing that have been used for thousands of years you know mm -hmm. um and i want to learn more about those as well so um, do you have any think, advice at the moment for um great native edibles that we could pop in our gardens <clears throat> Well, I think um, red currants, the prickly currant um, is really, really popular and it's prolific. I mean, yes. they just pop up everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also a native um, elder berry, there's okay. pigeon berry, mm -hmm. there's a lot of native herbs. Um, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the um, proper botanical <laughs> name for them. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so really good, useless. I'm the same. <laughs> words sorry but there are um the the native oregano native thyme um mm -hmm. there's all sorts of things like and your lily pillies all lily pillies mm -hmm. um you know they've got the edible berries um so depending on what sort of garden you've got if you've got just a small little urban garden definitely go to your local indigenous nursery and pick up some tube stock or some native herbs yeah and just chuck them in Love it because um, I think yeah I think it's it's probably a really good idea to start you know um, getting used to growing more native foods because they grow really well this is where they belong this is their climate you know and you can't really go wrong there and they taste amazing um, and I think that everyone should really give them a go even yeah. if it's just herbs yeah. you know um, but the prickly currants. Oh, they're I so prolific here. Yeah. all in, there's so many of them yeah. everywhere i was just um at a, you know out a local area i <laughs> say so where but uh, what well, hillsville sanctuary <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and they've got heaps of them there and all these people wandering around and I'm just like, oh, yum, yum, <laughs> this is so good. My so, kids love oh, them. Oh, why is that lady eating all those berries? Aren't they poisonous? <laughs> No, my kids not. love they're them delicious. and they can um, they can identify them and so when we walk down our property or in the bush they'll um they'll see it and they'll they know if they're really red that they can eat them but they will they'll pick them yeah. and eat them um i wanted oh, to make a beautiful. jelly out of them but they're so small and so fiddly to pick that i've kind of um yeah given up on that idea yeah you it's to be honest they're just one of those sort of foraging berries like when you're out in the bush going for a walk or whatever or just pottering around your garden they're just something that you pick periodically just to eat because they are quite small and you'd have to you'd be there for hours (laughs) picking enough for a jar of jam (laughs) but you know but plant and lily peeling that prolifically Mm. fruits they do have you know jam and everything i think you made champagne or something recently or not with you? not with the um lily pillies but i would like to give it a go <laughs> oh okay well someone I, made cha- I, I thought it was you but someone um, on my page no, i think was- yeah oh okay yeah so just yeah um anything basically um to do with alcohol i'm on <laughs> that there's also I'm kangaroo sure apples <laughs> Um, yeah, kangaroo which, apples as well, but you have to wait till they're really, really ripe. That's so, right, right, yeah. Um, they grow like a weed here. Um, it's yeah. got random ones popping up because of the birds in the forest next door, so. Um, yeah, but any any sort of native plants that, you know, bring in the wildlife as well, you know, mm. um, is a good thing. Yeah. So, you know, I try and plant a mixture of non-natives and natives, you know, because I want to yep. probably pollinate my i want all the pollinators coming to my garden so yeah. i plant loads and loads of things you know no so and that yeah so um, um and i, I think someone mention, sorry i was quickly pop in before we move away from the kangaroo apple i think someone said to me once that you can graft an eggplant onto it because it's in the solanaceae family um so that way you can have a ah. perennial eggplant outside um that won't die with the frost Interesting. Yeah. I yeah. wouldn't mind giving that a go just to see what happens. That's it sounds like an experiment waiting to happen. Yes. I do have one in my veggie patch, so maybe I should just do it. <laughs> yeah, just do it. That's what I would do for sure. I was just gonna say I just mentioned something about my runner beans actually. Mm-hmm. Um and just because uh, I had to build the trellis. Mm-hmm. Um I I stole my mum's curtain rods to do it. <laughs> Does she know? <laughs> does she know now does now, does now. <laughs> and she had a few spares in the garage and i took those as well <laughs> nice. so you know i don't i don't really like buying like steaks and things if i don't need to i'll forage them nice <laughs> yeah so I just wanted to chuck in that little funny anecdote because it was, yeah. it was hilarious. And I'm no. still laughing at it now. Mum came over yesterday. Oh, my curtain rods are serving their purpose really well, aren't they? Oh, nice. <laughs> yes, Thanks, it's a true story. <laughs> um, can we go back to biodiversity? So I know that you've done your biodiversity yeah. diploma. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, I'm doing, um, I'm doing the Diploma of Sustainable Living with the University of Tasmania and I just completed the Biodiversity Unit, okay, which was right. amazing, by the way. Yeah. So um, biodiversity in the garden, something that I'm learning about or really making an effort into creating a biodiverse, biodiversity in my gardens this year. Um, but would you like to share your thoughts on that and how you would um, create a biodiversity, biodiverse environment? I don't even know the words to say. <laughs> no, that's all right. I completely get what you're trying to say. It's all right. Oh, um, quite often when people talk about biodiversity, um, you know, they sort of think it's just plants or just animals or something like that. But really it's the whole system. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so if you get, um, if you plant um, a diversity of plant, different plants, trees and that sort of thing, you're going to get more wildlife coming into your garden, you know, um, whether it be, you know, honey eaters, if you plant grevilleas or, mm-hmm. um, you know, sedges for your, you know, little tiny little birds or bandicoots or 
you know mm. so it's all it's just a matter of um what you want to attract into your garden and planting accordingly mm -hmm. so um for me i've got um you know um we've got cholestamins and um banksias and that sort of stuff so with the banksias we do actually get the the black cockatoos nice in that top of that tree um and they love banksia so um you know if you if you start planting things like that you're going to encourage these birds that are vulnerable mm. um you know into your garden to feed um and also but it, you know it starts from you know the canopy down basically mm -hmm. um and you know lizards and things so i make um you know like little I've got rock piles everywhere and fallen logs and all that sort of thing just to make a habitat. It's all about habitats as well. Yeah. Um, so um, creating um, habitats increases the biodiversity of animals, mm -hmm. basically, as well as plants. Nice. Um, and, and also for pollinators as well. So I plant for um, native bees and the European honeybee because mm -hmm. I know Many people talk about the European honeybee, but really we do need them. Um, um, so I try and invite, you know, all is welcome. Apart from the European wasps, they yes. can stay out. Agreed. <laughs> I don't want those. I saw one in my <laughs> garden yesterday or the day before. Uh, it was yeah, yeah. I'll away. tell you a story about that <laughs> off the video, okay? <laughs> uh, but um, if you think of biodiversity um, as an entire system, that's the most important thing. It's it's you know um, you, you want you don't want just magpies. You don't want mm. you know just bees. You want to encourage everything. So you got your frog bog. So mm. you can um, you know anyone can have a frog bog in their garden. They're so easy to create. Yeah. And then you just plant some native plants around it. You know for the frogs and then encourages the insects that the frogs you know will eat mm -hmm. and the little lizards that also eat you know um mosquito larvae and that might you know all that sort of thing so everything has has its purpose when you invite it into your garden so yeah. um but i my yeah so I, it, it really is just to plant a diverse range of plants you know yeah. all different types of you know different you know like things for little bird like wrens to hide in nice. you know um and yeah so i hope i've sort of covered that okay it's just it is kind of hard even though i do it all the time i practice it every day yeah. um, but when i talk about it it's like i can't get my message across properly. <laughs> yeah no that's all right i, I just is it's, it's just creating a whole system um, and the more diverse you are with that system, the more diverse wildlife that you are going to um, have in your garden. Everything has its purpose, whether it be pollinating, whether it be pest control, mm. um, or just, you know, habitat for birds that are vulnerable because yeah. of, you know, urban yeah. sprawl, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. Which um, is basically permaculture mm. in a nutshell. Really. I mean... Yeah, well, look there's aspects of permaculture in every part of our lives i i think um you know it's it's all about the principles of um permaculture and also the ethics yeah so it's not just of care of people but it's i say it's care of everything really yeah every living being um needs care and looking after i mean you know who would ever thought that our koalas are heading down mm. toward the vulnerable status you know yeah. it's devastating it's, you know it's it's scary so mm. it's just um we really need to take care of our um diversity of plants yeah. um and plant more native plants as well yeah natives is the way to go um look i've got magnolias in my garden and i absolutely adore them but i also mm. am aware that i need native plants to bring in those native animals just to yeah. keep the healthy ecosystem going as well yeah which is also really important yeah I want to share a story about, <clears throat> sorry, I want to share a story about um, our frog bog, which is very unintentional. So we live on a slope, a 30 degree slope. And so our house site is cut into the slope and we have about a meter and a half, um, quite a steep rock retaining wall 
um, which leads to a drain, a diversion drain, um, and then we've got a metre and a half and then it's the house. So that metre and a half is under a veranda. And this year, the frogs breeding in that diversion drain was insane. They were so loud that they kept me wow. awake all night for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. And I couldn't sleep because they oh were just goodness. at it. Like they were at it all night. And my husband didn't notice until I went, babe, can you hear the frogs? Like that is so loud. He's like, I didn't notice until you mentioned it. And now I can't not notice it. And so we just didn't, <laughs> <laughs> didn't sleep for that's quite a while. Fantastic. Um, but that's oh, just that's such an cool. unintentional um, example of if you leave it, you know, we've got this water sitting there, obviously, overgrown with yeah. weeds, mosquitoes, yeah. the frogs came and here we are. <laughs> I think that's amazing. And that, that's the thing. It doesn't need much. Like you can just, it doesn't have to be like this immaculate pond, you know, yeah. you can just dig a hole in the ground, basically, yeah. you know, um, and just plant a few things and the nature will come. It takes yeah. care of itself. You yeah. know, I think. If you if you give it the platform and a few things to help it on its way, it will take care of itself if if we allow it to. Yeah, and um, I've seen that with we, white butterflies this year. Um, I've had so many white butterflies. I think it's because the roadside mustards have gone crazy with the rain, um, and they were much yeah. earlier than usual. And um, I wasn't doing anything about it, and then um, I noticed that the um, parasitic wasp had moved in which will inject its eggs into the caterpillar um, and then those eggs kind of control the caterpillar to keep living yeah. and keep eating and then they start eating the caterpillar but they don't eat its organs and then they hatch out of this caterpillar into their cocoons um, and the caterpillar can't reproduce it can't pupate and so it was really cool that I was lazy and didn't get rid of the caterpillars and so I had this explosion of moths um, but then nature came in and did something about it for me. Really, really cool. Even though it was really barbaric. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Isn't you know, nature though? I've, I've seen, yeah, I know, but I've, I've, I've seen that happen in my own garden this year and I've had exactly the same problem. Probably not on the same scale as you because you've got that huge, magnificent market garden, but I've seen the same thing and it's just like, oh God, that's so barbaric to see but oh gee i'm really glad that they're taking care of those caterpillars because they're just taking you know it's just amazing isn't it yeah. and like i watched the hoverflies searching out for the mm. aphids you know so yeah i planted so many calendulas this year the, the hoverflies yeah. absolutely love calendulas they do yeah um above anything else that i've planted they love those the most and are they the ones that sleep in it I haven't actually seen, I've seen one dead in, in, in a calendula. I've never actually seen one to sleep in it. So I've had some sort of native bee um, or hoverfly or something. I don't know what it was, um, but I'd pick the calendula, bring it inside to make a salad and I'd open it up because it's early in the morning and it's not fully opened with the sunlight. And there's these sleeping bees in there. And so I have to take it back outside oh. and pick another one. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, oh, I've not actually seen that happen. I know blue banded bees um, sort of take a perch for the night, sort of mm. thing. You know, like they sort of grab onto a stem or a stalk of some some sort. But yeah. I've never really heard of. I mean, I've seen pictures, you know, floating around on Facebook of bees asleep in a flower, but I've never yeah. actually seen it with my own eyes. Yeah, Next I haven't seen it this year. Yeah, I will. Um, I haven't noticed any this year, um, but I'll keep my eye open. It's still early in the season, so um, maybe they just haven't yeah. notified yet. Who knows? Well, I had to. I, I, my mum's um, roses had aphids this year, and I'm, I'm sort of teaching my mum a little bit. <laughs> I feel like I went to her after stealing the curtain rods. Um, <laughs> I said, gee, Bum, you've got a lot of aphids. I'm like, she said, yeah, I'm going to spray them, you know. I said, no, you're not. Let's have a look for ladybirds, you know. <laughs> let's have a, let's see. And I saw, like, some ladybird larvae, and they were all over it. And she, wow. I said, Mum, you're going to get ladybirds. Look, nice. I found lots of them. And she goes, what are those ugly things? <laughs> <laughs> I said, 
they do, you know, it's like they're going to become these beautiful lady bears, you yeah. know, and it's like, oh, okay, you know, each day she gave me an update on no. these larvae, you know, so, um, but yes, the ladybirds came. Um, I've got a funny story about ladybirds. In prep. Right, go for it. I want In... to hear a funny story. <laughs> In my son's prep class, he had to do, prep or grade one, I can't remember. Um, he had to do this research product project on a bug and he chose ladybug. And so he learned all about them and he's really good with nature. So that's his thing. And anyway, a couple of years later, we were moving out of Fentry Gully. So maybe it was a year and a half later. Um, there's this bug inside and... <laughs> He's talking with my husband. I'm in a different room, but I can hear the conversation. And Israel goes, <laughs> Dad, that's a ladybug um, baby. Like, it's a baby ladybug. And my husband's like, he's going to kill me for saying this. He's like, no, it's not. And Israel's like, yes, it is. He's like, stop it. No, it's not. And Israel's like, it is. It is. And you wouldn't let him say, but I did a project on it. And Paul was just so <laughs> adamant that it wasn't. And so I call out, I'm like, babe, maybe it is because he did a project on it last year or whenever it was. And so he comes into the bedroom and he Googles it on his phone. He's like, oh, <laughs> it is, <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> so we all learned something. <laughs> I know it's so cool when we can educate people like that, but especially when it's a young child educating their father, it's even yeah. better. Yeah, it's priceless. Yeah, <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. I love that. But I just, you know, I think, you know, it really does. It is important, though, isn't it? You know, for people to sort of learn about what's happening in their garden. When you mm. think about the permaculture principles about observe, you know, observing. Um, you know, and I often say to clients, you know, just spend a year or, a, you know, even just a season, just watch what the sun does, you know, watch, you know, what wildlife is coming into your garden, you know, and all this sort of thing before we change anything, let's just see what's happening here already. Yeah. You know, um, cause I think quite often people are trying to do the right thing, but at the same time, they're removing things that are already in use from. Yeah. pollinators or animals or anything like that you know yeah. thinking that they're doing the right thing so I think I'm it's really important to just <laughs> I think we all are I think we all are but this is how we learn you know yes. it's it's it, there's not it's, I mean it's not really sort of saying oh you're wrong you know you should mm. shouldn't be doing that it's not it's it's all about the learning process That's and right. you know um and so I think that's what I think we we're taught really well with our permaculture with the you know that observe mm -hmm. principle is really important it's probably one of the most important ones to be Agreed. honest with you yeah. um yeah especially when you're on a new site mm. um and yeah so um so many people are just wanting everything now you know i want all these plants now it's like yeah. okay if we plant them you know before summer they'll all be dead by autumn let's yeah. just wait till autumn and then you won't have to spend all your money again yeah that's right <laughs> you know, it's just yeah so um it's all it's all it's all relative to just observing and taking time and not rushing things just watch what's happening first before you change anything and I understand the excitement because I've been there. So you've got your new dream property yeah. and there's all these things that you've been thinking about and wanting to do. And I was the same. I did the yeah. same thing. Um, we're lucky we didn't make any major mistakes. We did plant our citrus in an area that was uh, forever wet. It doesn't even dry out in summer. They were looking really sick. We're lucky that we were able to dig them out and move them before they died. But that was probably the biggest mistake and um, planting some native trees in our fire sector. Um, uh, which basically are all eaten by wombats anyway now. So, <laughs> um, well, they showed you then, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Don't fence it. Oh God, I'm, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't be so mean. <laughs> Apologies. Um, but I've already got I've already got um, native trees in my fire sector because um, the neighboring property, um, the first person that built on it wanted to regenerate the land and the people who are on it now, their goal is to regenerate the land, which I'm all for. Um, but I suppose for me now, I need to be mindful that if I'm going to have a bushfire, it's majority, majority of the time it's going to be coming from the West. 
Um, that's my primary fire sector. So I need to think about planting trees that could trap embers if um, that was ever to go up for whatever reason. Um, it needs to trap embers so it doesn't get to the house. And our orchards, which are more, yeah. the most important thing. So um, I think that was the biggest thing that I got out of the PDC was observe and then think about everything mm-hmm. in that circle in your um, sector analysis. So your, your winds, your fires, your, your winter and summer suns um, and whatever else I've missed. <laughs> Yeah, that sector analysis was quite um, a challenge for me in the beginning, Mm. Um, you know, to sort of get my head around it. But now I understand it and it's just, it's so important, um, you know, just to map your sun and where the wind's coming from and those fire threats for sure. Yeah. Um, You know, and your property would have been a bit of a challenge, I would imagine, you know, um, in some regards to where, you know, with wind and that sort of thing. I... I, this sounds really naive. <laughs> Sorry. Am I okay? I'm okay on my end. Um, yeah, yeah. No, you're good. You're good now. <laughs> um, when we bought this property, even though it's on a really steep open hill, I didn't even cross my mind about winds. I didn't even think about it being windy here. But it is so, so windy. The first year, the first spring, it was the windiest of all the springs so far. So we've had three springs. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think I can live here anymore. Because six out of the seven days, you couldn't stand outside without being on an angle. And so you couldn't safely wow. work. You had dust blowing in your eyes. You had risk of trees falling down. And that went on for a month and a half, I think. And I was just like, I'm not cut out for this. I don't like winds. I'm fearful of winds. Um, and so thankfully it hasn't been as bad, but um, it's really made us think about putting in those wind breaks to deflect mm-hmm. some of that wind, um, mm. diffuse it a little bit at least, um, because there's trees in the orchard that are growing on an, on a, on an angle because um, the wind just beats from the west um, and there's no protection mm. there. But I don't know why I didn't think that it was not going to be windy here. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, well, you know, this is, these are all things that we learn after a time. I mean, they say when you move into a property, you spend the first year observing it. Yeah. You know, and what happens yeah. and things. But I still think it's an amazing property. You've done such a great job with it. And, Thank you know, you. overcoming these hurdles as you go. It's mm-hmm. just, it's been an absolute joy to watch, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> not only has your property evolved, you have as well. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, yeah. just... From when I've even when I first met you, you know, mm. to now, just seeing everything that you're accomplishing is just incredible. Yeah. You know, and I hope that one day I can not have to steal my mum's curtain rods <laughs> and have my own space to grow runner beans. Nice. <laughs> well, managing so well, those beans out there are absolutely incredible. I've they got, they're eight feet tall, they're about five feet wide more than that actually and so many flowers mm. you know and you can like, dry those you know, beans too. Have... so there's a way that you can preserve Pardon? those you can dry those beans too really? yeah so um, oh, you can either, you... um you can either let them dry in the bush but if you do that production will decrease but if you get some bread crates or make up some wire screens you could probably pick them when they get really fat and just lay them on there to dry and then you've got dried beans for winter Perfect. I want to do that. And that's easy. Like that's even easier than tomatoes. (laughs) It is easy. That's something that I can do. (laughs) I must admit, there's nothing more prettier than a scarlet runner bean, is there? Oh, they're gorgeous. You know, the actual seed inside. They're they're so beautiful. It's it's a shame to plant them sometimes, but (laughs) I must admit, we probably have got a few more than we actually, because I thought, oh, I'm growing in pots, so we'll put like three beans in each pot, you know, just in case, you know, two don't survive. Yeah. And three pots. We've got nine plants out there. They all germinated. And they're all going, oh, we love it out here. It's so (laughs) nice and warm, you know. (laughs) Nice. And I did have to teach my husband the other day how to poll- hand pollinate the uh, zucchinis. So oh, yes. I think he felt he like had to have a shower <laughs> afterwards. I told my told neighbor about this. <laughs> she, I'm like, <laughs> I said, this. <laughs> <laughs> have I shown you how to pollinate? Because she's like, I, I'm like, do you know how to pollinate um, zucchinis? Because she was talking about the ones that I'd given her. 
She's like, no. I'm like, well, let me show you. <laughs> let me show you. This is the boy. <laughs> and this is the girl. <laughs> We're gonna have a little lesson in the birds and the bees. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what we did. And I said, you just do this with the flower. <laughs> I said, just rip all the petals off so it's all exposed, and then in it goes. I <laughs> oh, love it. <laughs> you know, just to you know, I mean, <laughs> and I ended up with a zucchini this big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's too funny isn't it you know <laughs> yeah. um but uh I, yeah i should mention um i don't know if anybody knows this but i mean probably everybody knows this you know but um ants actually pollinate as well you know like the tiny little black ants you yeah. know they they're really like if you've got um pumpkins or zucchinis in the ground mm. um probably not so much with pots but i did notice i had some in my pots but they walk, they pollinate, they walk in and out of the, those big flowers and they yeah. pollinate really, really well. So, yeah. um, yeah, I think it's important that people don't just automatically kill ants because yeah. <laughs> yeah, they the are, other, they are good little pollinators. The other thing that pollinates are flies. Flies are all over my coriander flowers. Absolute yeah, chockers. absolutely. And I never yeah. thought flies are I never did too, actually. I think I learned about that um, on Gardening Australia a couple of years ago, I think. Um, okay. They were talking, they had this fly guy on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, and he said, um, pollinate, you know. So, yeah, just um, I think people need to um, be careful about, you know, what they're spraying around in their garden or, you know, mm -hmm trying to get rid of because they shouldn't be spraying anything except the hose yeah. <laughs> so yeah but um yeah no I'm, I'm actually quite amazed by um how much pollination is actually happening under there i watched the bees come in and go to the scarlet runner beans um yeah. the flowers and they're just buzzing around up there and then they're trying to find their way out from underneath the, um, the patio area and they find their way out eventually. Um, but that was one of my concerns, pollination, but it seems to be working okay. Nice. So I'm really happy about that. There's um, no excuse really now in the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about our PDC um, because both of us really were impacted by that. Um, we're both working as permies now. Um, Jane does a lot of consultations and design work. And I've been doing that as well as teaching online. Um, so I don't know how many others in our class are because I've kind of gone off social media um, mid last year when I just couldn't handle all the COVID stuff anymore. And basically my only social media is Instagram, which is full of gardening stuff. Um, but um, Jane is someone I keep in touch with and uh, we both encourage each other in our work and um, I just wanted to talk about yeah our PDC and do you think it would be worth it for someone who's listening um, if they didn't want to work in the industry but they just wanted to grow food do you think that doing a PDC would be something that would be beneficial to them? Absolutely. I honestly, yeah, absolutely. Hands down, definitely. And I've actually told many people, including clients, which is actually, you know, put me out of some work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's more about the whole permaculture system, isn't it? I mean, the information really is fluid. And I just think that um, if, if, someone was um, wanting to grow their own food and actually have a food production system, um, a PDC would really help them with a permaculture um, design. So um, help them actually design that system, you know, because it looks into all sorts of aspects of it, doesn't it? You know, like the, yeah. the, the sun, you know, the, you know, the weather and all of that sort of thing. Um, but I think that, um, anyone that is planning on you know incorporating food production mm. whether it's for themselves or to make a living i think doing a pdc would be invaluable information for them even if they didn't go on and do design work yeah um because i got so much out of it and i've got you know community 
out of it and made new friends as well. It's not just about the learning curve. Yeah. Um, it's about who you meet along the way um, because people you meet um, in that class can often influence how you think as well and yeah. how you see the world and how you learn about permaculture. Yeah. Um, and it's all relevant. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I think so. Um, at first, I probably would have said no because um, I, I feel like people go there to learn how to grow food and you're not going to learn how to grow food. You're going to learn how to create a system um, yeah. to be as um, efficient in your production as possible. Um, what you're going to learn is placements, um, companion planting, all that sort of stuff. You know, for me, making hot compost, I'd never made hot compost before. Um, but for me, that's yeah. been a game changer this year. Absolute game changer. My mm. garden is is flourishing because of it. Um, mm. uh, what else? Uh, getting other people's ideas, bouncing ideas off each other. Um, yeah, and design. Something that I've struggled. I didn't know where to start, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. When we moved here, I had tried to do a, a design. And I had a fairly good um, knowledge base of permaculture prior to doing the course, but I didn't know how to put it all together into a design and make it work and flow and be this functioning system. Um, yeah. That's just, yeah. Efficient. Yeah, because, yeah, that's right. And I, I suppose when, when you do do a PDC, you actually learn that permaculture is an entire system. Yeah. It's not just about, you know, um, food growing, like you say. It is yeah. about design <laughs> and um, sustainable, sustainable design as yeah. well. Yeah, that's right. And um, hopefully when you implement these um, sustainable systems, they're there to stay, um, yeah. which is the whole idea, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, so when, when um, I, I, it'd be... I can see already that since the PDC, how much um, things have changed for you and how you do things in your yeah. garden. Yeah. And, you know, it's bit like with the hot compost as well and how you actually build those beds and, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, the way that you think about the future as well, like yeah. how things are going to happen, you know, with your succession growing or in yeah. the winter and things like that. Because, we learned all about weather, the weather and the climate and all that sort of thing as well. So, yeah. um, and um, yeah, so, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So I, I think that um, people that want to do similar to what you're doing, for yeah. sure, would definitely benefit from that. Yeah. Um, for me, it was consolidating well, everything as well. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> it sort of teaches you how to sort of put things together yeah. um, as a system. You know, you, you've got all these components like, you know, your vegetable garden, your orchard, yeah. you know, um, your compost. Um, mm -hmm. And then you've got, you know, your, your home where you're looking at passive solar or cooling or anything like, you know, those sort of things. It's all, you know, a part of what that one system and doing a PDC helps that gel together yeah you know, definitely and just yeah and how you understand that i mean you know there's people like you and i that can help people out there um do this by design and consultation and things like that because doing a pdc is it for everyone not everyone yeah. can you know take time off work and all that sort of stuff but there's um you know um and that's when you can talk to people like us but you know i just think that it's invaluable um um experiences as yeah. well you know and you know I, I love for instance i wouldn't have met you so that's right <laughs> you know yeah it's you know like doing that it's it literally changed my life literally yeah. so you know um and i'm just I, i'm just loving that and i'm still learning as i go you know like it's it, you're always going to be learning um mm. but those those Things that are fundamental things that we learn is something that we can current continue to build on, I think. Yep. And that's invaluable to me. So what brought you to permaculture? Because for me, permaculture was completely new um, when I met my husband, but his dad had done a PDC. And so he introduced me to this term and then we got a few books and then we kind of dived deeper as our journey towards owning land, um, you know, came closer. 
but I'm interested to hear why or how you found out about permaculture. Um, okay, so uh, I was still working at my previous job um, back in tw late 2018 and um, I decided that um, eventually, early in the next year as it turns out, that I was going to leave that job and I wanted to um, do something different. I wanted to be a gardener. Anyway, so I also wanted to do further learning. So I signed up to do, uh, I enrolled um, to do the Diploma of Sustainable Living with the University of Tasmania. Um, and, uh, and I did Science of Gardening uh, 1 to start with, and then Science of Gardening 2, which was more of a design unit. Um, and they had a section in that I was already gardening so like I, I'd already got the gardening bug and plants and growing food like that was already something that was you know I knew that um, I was going to be evolving that into a business but then they did this part of the um, module on permaculture um, and it was it was a brief module but it was enough to just hook me in straight away and I and I yeah so they spoke about permaculture and it was, it was just a basic um explanation really just talking about what it meant um and you know it sort of you know it was enough though for me to sort of think that this is something that makes sense to me mm -hmm. um and I want to learn more about that um, okay. and so then I did as you did you know I bought a couple of books and started doing you know surfing the internet and finding out oh this is you know so um yeah so 2019 for me um was when I started my gardening business mm -hmm. um and I, I I'm an organic gardener um and then I was starting to learn more and more about permaculture and I realized that um I wanted to expand on that and um, I started googling how to learn more and that's how I found out about um, the permaculture design course mm -hmm. and I realized um, that I could do one locally <laughs> to me you know nice. in Mombolt with um, with Pete yeah um, so and that's sort of what led me there and as soon as I walked in that gate on the first <laughs> day um, and saw Pete and Sylvia I thought yeah it, like it just changed my life forever and nice. just you know it really has it's just changed my the whole way of thinking um to a way of thinking that was always sort of just probably there but it's just sort of brought it out mm -hmm. you know and helped me understand it but yeah it was that 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 diploma that one unit that one module in that unit that hooked me in and got me interested in it so you know they just it's it's out there you know people are hearing this all the time and it's mm -hmm. like Permaculture, mm. permaculture, you know, it's yeah. like, it's been around for quite some time, you it know, has, but it's yeah. like, I haven't heard about it, you know, so, um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's been an amazing journey so far. I'm yeah. grateful for that. And yeah, so, and I'm thinking I'm going to do another PDC, by the way. What? <laughs> yeah. Your um, certificate? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I just, I thought I actually spoke to um, Peter about it because, um, and he suggested doing one further north in a different climate. Oh, okay. Um, you know, just for something different, you know, for mm -hmm. a different sort of um, perspective. Um, okay. And I've spoken to a few people actually in this area, um, clients and other people that I met along the way. And it's surprising the amount of people that have actually done two PDCs. There you go. Um, and yeah and i i mean i get the feeling that it's mainly for different sort of perspective and learning you know and the way people teach things and where mm -hmm. they are and i'm sure everybody's different you know um yeah. as we were taught everyone's permaculture is different that's right <clears throat> yeah that's would you consider doing another one um <clears throat> i'm probably pressed for time um yeah but also with COVID, like I'd hate for what happened to our course happen again um, because I really enjoyed the in-person part of it. And then the other part got, um, went online, which was fine. And it was, it was actually a blessing because I was able to dive deeper into topics that I wouldn't possibly have. So, you know, mm. self-learning, self-taught, all that sort of stuff. So mm. really diving mm. into soil health um, because I couldn't go to class. So I would just do my own research. 
Um, but I missed that community of it and just with things, how things are going this year, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to be stuck in our homes again and not being able to, I oh, might not be able to go to Metro. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm trying not to think about that, to be honest with you. Yeah. Oh, maybe one day in the future, you know, a few years down the track, maybe when the kids are a bit older, it might yeah. be easier for you to think about doing another one at some point. But yeah, yeah, I think, I, but I'm definitely going to. Um, I don't know when I'm going to do it because I want to try and do a, um, a degree okay. um, next year. Um, and um, um, I think it was uh, land, biodiversity, land management or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, um, eco something. I can't, sorry, I sound like <laughs> a real, you know, dill trying to remember what it's called, but I, I just can't remember what it's called, but it's something really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's all good. <laughs> No, so following yeah, along the so, same path because we all have yeah, our own much. we all have our own thing of what permaculture is and what we specialize in in permaculture i yeah. think for you that's definitely natives in with the edibles um and biodiversity have i got that right yeah 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 and then absolutely yeah for me it's self-sufficient living and creating these um, systems that are able to feed your family and beyond if um yeah so I think that's really awesome for you because that really does follow on with your path and where you're headed. Um, and I think that's why I didn't end up doing the sustainable course, the, the diploma of sustainable living is because a, I don't have the time with three kids to school them and then school myself yeah. again um, and then run businesses on the side and grow food <laughs> and preserve yeah, it's, that food. It's a lot. <laughs> it is a yeah, lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, yeah. But for me, if I was to further on my my education would probably be in preservation um, and seed savings. So seed savings, what I'm really diving into in 2021, I don't want to be buying any more seeds, which is huge for me because I'm a seed whore. Um, and I... Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> and so I have bought a couple of books in seed saving because I only grow heirlooms, so I might as well take advantage of that. So spacing them um, and then excluding them um yeah. staggering the times and then the art of actual seed saving so for me i think my further education will be preservation of food seed saving and then um maybe even something in soil um getting that soil health and the microbes and all mm. that sort of stuff happening because i've been playing with making my own microbes that i like to go go at it from a science point of view which is full on for me because i hate science um, I failed. Oh, well, I thought I did too, but I actually ended up quite liking it in the end. <laughs> well, maybe it's changed. Maybe it's changed. Soil work, you know. <laughs> I, um, I happened so, to avoid all science subjects except for horticulture when I went through high school. So um, that's how much I disliked it. But um, just seeing the soil life um, grow um, and increase fertility is something that I'm interested in, in developing a bit more. Yeah, good for you. That sounds amazing. Yeah, so see where we go from that. <laughs> um, no, I think that's great. I think, you know, I think we find as we go through life and things change, we just naturally evolve into and go down paths, you know, and um, learn things as we go in our own way and in our own time, you yeah. know. So that's, that's yeah, so cool. Like, yeah. But to clarify, yeah, like I wouldn't, thought. I wouldn't change doing the PDC, but I don't know if I'll do a second one hmm. as yet. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. You know, it's like the, I didn't really think about it um, until just last month, and you know, hmm. uh, it's just something I've been thinking about. I think it's because I'm I've only got two units left of the, my diploma, and then there's a little bit of time before I start doing a degree, and I just yeah. think. Mm. Yeah you know what am I gonna do <laughs> I mean you know I, I need to be studying and doing things now now that I've got a taste for it I don't want to stop studying I just want to yeah. learn yeah. um you know whether it eventuates to anything to do with my business it's um irrelevant I just want to keep learning um mm. you know and I'm hoping that um if I keep learning more about the earth and how to conserve it that's cool with me yeah would you consider doing an internship at a permaculture farm instead or as well? Um, yeah, I would. Um, and I have thought about that. Um, 
I have thought about it actually because I suggested it to somebody else, a client actually, because she she wants to do, you know, she needs help on her farm and when it's all up and running and everything. Um, but I'm not. I would, yeah, I would, but um, now that I have my own business, mm. I know this is going to sound terrible because <laughs> I do, I do, like, I don't want it to sound like, you know, I wouldn't do it, but I would, but I'm still in that, I don't want to work for anyone else at the moment, you know. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> We're the same. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Even though I would be learning, um, yeah. but I'm still, in, I'm still in the honeymoon period of having my own business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear that. I, yeah, um, but it was it would probably definitely be something that I would think about in the future, just yeah. not at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, but I think there's a really great opportunity for um for anyone wanting to learn about, you know, permaculture and, you know, growing food and all that sort of thing. I think yeah. it's a really great idea. Yeah. You know? What would be your favorite thing to grow? uh tomatoes yeah tomatoes and the reason for that is is because um there's so many different types out there and i just love watching them grow i don't know what it is <laughs> about it but i just i love the smell of the leaves i love yeah. watching them grow um and um this year i can't remember what i planted because um i lost all the tags so it's like it's like um you know uh what do you call it when you don't know what's you know what's going to happen it's exciting <laughs> um, yeah exactly but i like you know sort of um, i just love tomatoes you know there's nothing better than growing your own tomatoes yeah. um and there's so many different varieties out there different colors shapes flavors and and yeah. uses so I'm really experimenting with that um, at the moment. So, well, this year, that's what I'm hoping to do. But, yeah, it would be tomatoes for sure. So are you someone who pinches laterals or leaves laterals? <laughs> uh, ooh, I pinch them out. <laughs> do you know what? It just really depends how lazy I'm feeling. <laughs> Um, but I do actually pinch them out, um, especially this year, only because well, uh, with La Nina, um, we've got a lot more moisture, yeah. And I really just want to try and, um, you know, if I've already got lots and lots of fruit on the plants anyway, yeah, mm. I'm pinching them out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, I am a pincher. <laughs> yeah, mostly, you know. And if if I if I miss any, my mum comes over and she does it for me. But yeah, so yeah, but I do, yeah. And um, what would be your biggest piece of advice for those people who are wanting to start their self-sufficient journey and maybe feel stuck, they don't know where to start, or maybe they're on rentals and you can offer them some advice on just how to get going? Um, well, just just try something. Um, you know, if you're already thinking about wanting to grow food or something like that, um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with just going to buy a pot if you've just got a small little area like I have, um, just buy a pot, some potting mix and a tomato plant or a zucchini, whatever you fancy, and just try growing it. That's, that's it's the best piece of advice I can give you is just to try. Yeah. Um, and then if you want to further that, inform, you know, that learning, you can just um, talk to someone like me or um, you, Nat. Um, I have I have queries all the time. I always get asked questions about things, and I'm always happy to, um, you know, answer questions, um, you know, whether they're clients or not, you know. Um, but I just think that um, just try, just get out there and try. Just buy a bag of potting mix and a pot, and just grow a tomato. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the best advice I can give you. Yeah. I agree. I think that's been a resounding answer so far in this podcast. Have series. I frozen again? You have, but I can hear you, so that's fine. Um, and I often get asked as well, like, what are my qualifications? Like, um, I think today I got asked that. Um, you know, how do I know so much? Um, and I do get asked that quite a bit um, through my social media, through Instagram. Um, and for that, I say, I've been growing in the garden with my mum since I was a girl and a teen. And um, 
then I took that with me to our first house and I made a lot of mistakes. I was growing on a Western facing slope with a lot of gum trees and hardly anything grew. Um, and then we t- took that to our other suburban house and I grew in a front yard and um, made a lot of mistakes there too, but also learned a whole heap. And from that, yeah. I've been able to bring it with me. And it's only in the la- like last year so um, that I actually did something about my qualifications and got a formal permaculture um, certificate. Um, but not just that, I've been reading books. I've been watching YouTube videos on people who really inspire me, like Jim Kovaleski or Paul Gauchy, even Joel Salatin, if we're looking at Broad Acre. And there's so many more. I mean, they're just the three, um, my three favourites. Um, but there's so many people that you can look to for advice who have been doing it for years, know what they're doing mm. in their situation, in their climate, and just go to that and um, glean as much information off them as you can respectfully. Um, yeah. A lot of people are willing to share, but there's a, I think there's a line, you know, um, that can be crossed. Um, but there's just so much information out there. Go to your local library and borrow some books or... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I mean, I have, like, I've had people asking me um, the same thing as well. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, sort of help people along their way. But if it seems like it's going to become a, um, like a project, someone mm. wants to take on a project, then it's, um, I'll suggest that I'll go and do a consultation with them, you know, yeah. um, and then that way that we can spend more time rather than worrying about if we're overstepping the mark with the questioning, you know, and all yeah. that sort of stuff, you know. Um, and and then you've got time to actually discuss things um, and talk about what they'd like to do and things like that. Um, but basically, it doesn't really matter how many certificates you have or how many yeah horticulture courses you do or anything like that you're still going to kill plants you're <laughs> yes. still going to make you're still going to make mistakes you're still going to stuff up most most of the qualifications that people have that are um, in our industry apart from those bits of paper is experience yeah that's um right. you know and and we all get there by learning like everybody else with experience and failing as well yeah, failing is right. part of gardening and you know, you may as well accept that now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you, you, you're going, you know, I lost all my rocket plants to caterpillars just last week. So, yeah. you know, um, I knew it was going to happen, but I let those cabbage moths, um, cabbage moths in there and I allowed them to lay <laughs> eggs everywhere and it didn't matter how many nasturtiums I planted, um, you know, it still happened. And these things happen, you know, they just do. Um, so I think if you just prepare for not being perfect yeah. all the time. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good advice. <clears throat> yeah. So and just don't be so hard on yourself. Mm. You know, if you, you know, something doesn't work out, it might not be any other reason except it just didn't work out. You know, yeah. there's just, there's always little details here and there that we might not never know why those tomatoes, you know, died or whatever, but, you know, it happens and it happens to everybody. It doesn't yeah, matter right. if you've been gardening a year or 50 years, it yeah, happens. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners today? Um, Well, the only thing I think I've already covered it, actually, the only thing that I would like to um, sort of share is that um, I, if you are thinking about starting to grow your own food, despite whatever space you've got, just give it a go. Mm. Just go and buy a, even if it's just a little pot with a punnet of lettuce, just nip down to your local nursery, buy a punnet of lettuces or herbs, plant them, watch them grow. And I guarantee you, when you harvest that first lettuce for your salad, you will then want to grow cucumbers, tomatoes, chilies, and all the other things that go along with that salad for your evening meal. Awesome. Just give it a go. That's, that's That's the only thing I really can think that will hopefully inspire people um and if yeah thank you so much for that jane uh really enjoyed our chat today it's been really fun um diving deeper with you i think it's been really easy because we actually know each other 
um, in real life and we've had these conversations in real life. Um, and yeah. um, so it's just been real easy, but really informative. And I think we touched on so many awesome things in there. Rental gardens, permaculture design certificates, um, biodiversity, um, and just advice for those wanting to start growing in their own garden. So I hope everyone who's been listening has enjoyed this. And I'll also leave Jane's um, Instagram for her garden um, page down below so you can go follow her. And if you are in um, the Dandenong Ranges and um, that part of Melbourne, you can contact her and she can come and design your garden if that is what you are looking for. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Thanks, Nat. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it's been really you. fun talking to you. It has. It's been really good. <laughs> Um, I'm we'll going to go and eat the zucchinis from my garden now. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye.